So I've just been kind of building my resume in terms of series and series ideas and various videos that I want to eventually become a staple of the channel. I don't want to bore you guys with any of the crazy details or anything like that because I do got some wild videos that I do want to start. But the most awkward part, honestly, is doing the very start to the series because it's like I almost have to introduce the series while explaining why I want to do this series. But in this case, I'm not going to explain why I want to do it. I'm going to do it for me. Hopefully you guys like it because you guys subscribe to me because you like me and if you like me you like what I like as you can see by this title this is a start to an amazing top 10 series that I personally think will be super super dope all of the top 10s I do will be my opinion and my opinion only of course I'm gonna back up what I say with facts stats and things like that when it comes to the all-time debate we all have to define what our criteria are and what we prefer because at the end of the day it is preference so when you're arguing Kobe versus Jordan Jordan versus LeBron whatever you're arguing it's all preference and what you desire with me I like a beast that's gonna score no matter what and you can do nothing to stop him that's Kobe he's my favorite player you see the jersey over there some people value that you can do everything on the court be the best passer of all time and score and really be secondary and that's your LeBron fans what people fail to realize is in the all-time debate you gotta have stipulations about what you're debating so in this case I think it'll be a bit different from normal top 10s because I feel like I add a perspective from the different normal top 10 picks. What I mean by that is there's unconventional top 10 picks that people wouldn't think to pick because most top 10s are a common consensus. It is a majority agreement. But with me, I feel that I'm such a big hoop head that there's going to be some people in my top 10. Like example, if I make a top 10 scorers list, George Gervin is going on that list. Many people wouldn't put him on there because they don't understand how good George Gervin really was, mainly because he was in a small market like San Antonio. But George Gervin, it really is isn't a household name the way someone like Isaiah Thomas, Michael Jordan, Larry Bird, Clyde Drexler, dudes of that time would be. And if you're not new, you already know what to do, gang. Go ahead and hit that like button. As y'all know, it helps me with the YouTube algorithm and getting on other people's YouTube pages and stuff. And do me a favor, new or not new, drop your top five PGs in the comments below. I wanna see if your top five aligns with mine. But without further ado, let's hop into this top 10. So at number 10, I got Steve Nash. Now, as I like to call him, my boy Steven Nashington, he's fourth in assists all time and has an MVP. Now, that MVP comes with controversy. I know it's two MVPs. I know. You know it just like I know it. Shaq was robbed. Steve Nash only deserved one of those MVPs. Steve Nash was really the last time the Suns were really good with Mike D'Antoni and Mari Stoudemire. You know, you had all those guys over there and their pick and roll game was virtually unstoppable. Especially when it came to Mike D'Antoni's seven seconds offense. That offense was virtually new to the league and it was almost impossible to stop except when they came and saw that boy Kobe being Bryant. Now Nash's ability to play make, shoot, and create off the dribble is unmatched despite his controversial mvps he was a generational talent nonetheless he got to be on the top 10 pgs of all time because he's one of the greatest pure point guards of all time at number nine russell westbrook the walking trip dub 2.0 though his last couple years have been a bit ugly his career as a whole has been very special in his career as a whole he's averaged 23 points per game eight assists per game and seven rebounds per game matching that with two steals per game on the defensive Event. Lately, I'm not gonna lie, I've killed Russ for his poor defense and his lack of want to on the defensive end. But in his prime, he was actually a very, very good defender. Maybe his athleticism hid that, never know. We know as of now, now that his athleticism is declining a little bit, he's not the defender he once was. You could see it break out when he would go for a crowd exploding dunk and get the thunder going. He would get a steal, break out for a dunk. Truth be told, I think Russell Westbrook was really the spark plug for that team he's the gas that made that fire ignite all the time again we can't let recency bias get in the way of how good of a career russell westbrook has had up until this point oscar robinson's triple double record seemed like a unicorn situation where we would never see it done again beaten tied or anything till russ came along russ is so good that he made the triple double seem like an ordinary thing people had to resort to calling him a stat pattern because he got triple doubles so easily and so frequently 
differently. Russell Westbrook, he got to be on this top 10 list. He was a no-brainer. Let's slide to number eight. At number eight, we got the original trip dub machine in Oscar Robinson. That's why I call Russell Westbrook 2.0 because he did end up beating the record. Oscar Robinson was amazing for setting the record in the first place. Oscar Robinson is seventh in assists, 13th in scoring, 75th in rebounds as a 6'5 point guard. And aside from the triple double record that Russ later beat, Oscar has one ring, an MVP, nine all NBA first team selections, and 12 all-star appearances. Again, he's the first player to ever average a triple triple double in league history before Russell Westbrook came and I think once Russell Westbrook broke his record it kind of hurt Oscar's legacy a tad bit because again Russ made that record and that stat line seem so ordinary that people didn't really hold it in high regard the way they used to. I truly think Oscar is an underrated player in history especially in terms of the mark he left on the league. I want to celebrate him and I put him at number eight on this list because he's one of the best point guards we've ever had. At number seven we got that boy Jason Kidd. Now he's doing his thing as a coach right now. He's coaching the Dallas Mavericks. I think he will end up coaching them to his first Western Conference championship. I'm um, not winning it, but getting to it at least. Jason Kidd is kind of tough because I'm one that values rings and seven seemed kind of high, but based on seeing who we put uh, uh, behind him, it makes sense and it follows the narrative. Jason is arguably the greatest pure point guard of all time. And when I say pure, I mean someone who can get you a bucket, but doesn't have to get you a bucket. He only gets that bucket when needed, when he needs to take control of the game. When I was young, I was being taught at a young age how to be a point guard. The number one thing that stuck with me all the time is a point guard makes your teammates better and he takes over the game when he needs to. That was Jason Kidd as a whole. His career averages weren't the most beautiful thing to see, but when you, he's one of those guys that when you watch him, you know he left his mark on the game by the end of the night. The way Jason Kidd or orchestrated in offense was poetry in motion truth be told and then on the defensive end he was locking up in his 19 year career he averaged 12 points per game nine assists per game six boards per game and two steals per game again jason kidd was one of the last pure point guards out there so his scoring total wasn't really anything to write home about he's one of those guys that you just watch his game and you truly understand why he's ranked and talked about the way he is in the top point guard conversation in the end of his career he had one ring five all NBA first team selections, 10 all star selections, and nine all defensive selections. Dude was tough on both the offensive and defensive end. And truth be told, I think the way he played, anybody could really make it to the NBA. As long as you can facilitate and play defense, truth be told, you're gonna have a spot on an NBA roster somewhere. Look at Rondo, he's still alive and kicking. And then his jump shot got better, but it's neither here nor there. At number six, we got the original IT Isaiah Thomas. Now, I love IT's game, and he was fundamental in beating the Jordan-led Bulls, and essentially being hated on by Jordan till this day. You gotta be a different dude to be hated by a guy for 20, 30 plus years. IT wasn't the most efficient, but he was an excellent defender, especially for his size. In his career, he averaged 19 points per game, 9.3 assists per game, and 3.6 rebounds per game, and an astonishing two steals a game. IT's numbers seem like any old role player's numbers, but I'm one of those that I value the eye test and the stat sheet and bring the two together to understand the full picture of the game. I feel like one over the other will always give you an inaccurate picture of the person, the player, and his game. And when you do that with IT's game and his tape, as well as the stat sheet, he always jumps out on the screen. Whether it's the stat sheet or whether it's the eye test and he's having a game where he's not scoring like crazy, he's playing great defense. He, it goes to show why he has the final MVPs that he has just watching him play. When he was done, he had 12 all-star appearances and five all-NBA selections to match with two titles. He could have a gold medal, but we all know what happened there. Now, if you made it to the top five, that tells me you rock with your boy and I rock with you. So go right ahead and hit that subscribe button for your boy and hit that notification bell to become part of the game because I really want you part of the game, especially if you got it this far. It would mean a lot to me. But in any case, to bring in the top five PGs of all time,
one. At number five, I got that man, John Stockton. Now his numbers weren't the prettiest when it comes to scoring, but we all know Stockton is the pristine model of what the traditional PG was. Get this, Stockton is the only player with more assists and steals than Jason Kidd. With 15,806 assists to Stockton's name, Jason Kidd isn't even close. The gap between Stockton's 15,000, almost 16,000 assists, and Jason Kidd's 12,000 is about the same distance as Jason Kidd from the 11th place person in the assist board. What makes that even crazier is when you go to look at the all-time steals list, Stockton's gap there compared to Jason Kidd is the same as Jason Kidd's gap to the 11th place guy in the all-time steals race, which is mind-blowing to even think about. In his career, Stockton averaged a double-double, getting 13 points per game, 10 and a half assists a game, and two rebounds per game, and he also got two steals a game. Now, it does come with controversy as there is a running narrative that Stockton's numbers were a bit cooked when he was in Utah, but honestly, this story's been debunked plenty of times, but honestly, it's fun to think about. I know I'm one of those guys that normally values rings over anything else, but it's kind of tough for a guy like Stockton to get a ring when you got Jordan on the other side that you got to see him. If you don't want to see him, you got the Bad Boys Pistons. If you're not going to see them, you're going to see Larry Bird in the side. Like, it's, it's going to be hard for them to win a ring. It's going to be hard to come out the West, nonetheless. So I, I commend Stockton and the Jazz for getting out the West as many times as they did because the West was no slouch back then. Now, if it was strictly based off of rings, course Stockton would be a lot higher but based on where he's placed on all-time list on top of what he's accomplished and as far as he's been able to get in his career he's top five gotta have him there number four now this one was tough for me but I gotta put Jerry West most people say Jerry West is a shooting guard I feel like he's interchangeable you look at his stats he played both so in this case we're going PG now this is a career I think goes a bit under the radar and rock with me on this stick with me first off his prime years were in the 70s so he's playing Larry Bird, Avocek, Kareem, Dr. J, Pistol Feet, and that's just to name a few. In his career he averaged 27 points per game. His career not one season not two seasons his whole career 27 points per game 5.8 rebounds per game and 6.7 assists per game and not to mention his last year which was the first year the steal stat was ever calculated he averaged a record-breaking 2.6 steals per game which is insane but it's even more insane when you think about the fact that this was a stat that was never recorded before so in his prime years imagine how many steals per game he was really getting and it makes sense because it goes with that 27 points per game three three ball era jerry was a four-time all-star 12 all-time nba selection a finals MVP, a five-time all-defensive team winner, and he just got one ring. Now, the rings are underwhelming, but bro, he's a logo. He didn't get that honor for no reason, bro. Put some respect on that man Jerry West name, for real. Now, my top three is pretty easily, and truthfully, this is probably a standard top three for anyone talking point guard, and they're pretty much gonna stay for the near future unless a certain someone wins two more rings or wins one final MVP, but we'll get to that in a moment. And number three, I got that point guard CP3. Now look bro, growing up, I used to want to play just like him, wear number three, have the one arm sleeve. It wasn't even AI that made me want to wear the one arm sleeve. It was Chris Paul. It always helps that the man averaged 19 points per game, 10 assists per game, and four rebounds per game including a nice 2.2 steals per game in his career so far. I can argue Chris Paul has had multiple primes in his 16th career. When he was young and played in New Orleans, he was a dog. He was extremely talented. Raw, of course, not battle tested yet, but he was very, very nice. And if the trade was not vetoed to LA, the Lakers, I think Kobe would have at least six rings, but that's neither here nor there. CP ends up on the Clippers. And though he hasn't been able to get that illustrious ring, this year with the Suns seems like his best opportunity to do so in the past the Clippers seemed like his best shot but we all know how egos played into the, uh, that team and why they didn't win but honestly I'm rooting for CP to get a ring at some point I don't really care for CP as the player if that makes sense I don't like the little antics he does the little you know elbows to the sternum he'll trip guys he'll do things and then I think it goes to a certain level when it comes to gamesmanship I think Chris Paul takes that a bit too far now I will say that is more of a a new narrative in my mind i felt like that more recently as i did when i was younger coming up cp is still that guy but this year i really want steph to get that finals mvp so this won't be the year for you cp i'm sorry number two that 
boy Wardell Stephen Curry. There's not much I need to say about the best shooter of all time, but I will anyway. And I'm a big up Steph, cause Steph is, well, actually truth be told, Steph is not a real Steph. His first name is Wardell. I am a real Steph. My name is actually Stefan. come on now. In his career, Steph averaged 23 and a half points per game, six assists per game, four rebounds per game. He averages 1.7 steals per game. And the reason I say this and didn't say for anyone else, because this is actually a number that is pretty rare. He averages four made threes a game. That's 12 points you can pencil Stephen Curry in for each night, basically. It's crazy because to me, Steph is at his greatest form right now. Some will say his stretch from 2015 to 2018 was his greatest time and his greatest peak as a player. However, I think now is his greatest time as a player. It's his greatest form. And that's simply because the size he's put on has helped him on the defensive end and he's become a much better defender than what he was before. Putting that size on has also helped him become a very good finisher up to an elite finisher at the rim to where he can control his body in the air a lot better and generate a lot more in ones, getting a lot more three point opportunities past the three point line. We've all seen the amazing shots and he's changed the game as we know it for whoever knows how long. I really think this is the new basketball and it's because of Steph Curry. Not that that's a bad thing, I like it. It's exciting. Like I said before, though, right before I went to my Chris Paul take, I think he's going to need to get two more rings or win one final MVP with one ring, and that'll elevate him to the number one of all time. Now, that is a point guard, and I say that to say this. Number one is Irvin Magic Johnson. I say and I specify point guard because I have a friend that his argument for Magic being one of the best point guards of all time is that he also played center when Kareem went down. Valid argument and that's valid for a regular all-time debate. But if we're talking all-time point guards, what he does as a center has nothing to do with what he did as a point guard. Moving on, while some of the numbers favor Steph, Magic still has a slight edge for me. Magic has five rings compared to Steph's three. Magic has three finals MVPs compared to Curry's zero. Magic has 12 all-star appearances. Curry has six. Magic has 10 all-NBA selections. Curry has six. Magic is the most dynamic player with the ball that I have ever seen. Again, he is the first player to ever play point guard and center. And truth be told, the Lakers need to fire Rob Palenka and get Magic back in there at GM. I say all that to say, Magic is going to be probably the greatest point guard of all time unless Steph realistically wins two more rings and probably gets two finals MVPs. Now, I say or because that's my list. But in general, for the masses, I believe he would have to do both. Win two rings and two finals MVPs with those rings. The reason I say that is because if you look at Steph's career, if you shrink it down to the six year run from when he stopped being hurt in the beginning of his career till now, he might just be one of the greatest players of all time. A career and an all time defining legacy spans across your whole career, not just a window. There has been polls that have asked, would you want Steph or would you want Magic? based on six years in their careers. It showed stats for Magic, stats for Steph. Most people chose Steph, but guess what? This is a marathon, not a sprint. The rabbit loses the race. Magic is number one, Steph is number two, and that's all I got for you guys in this video. If you found yourself enjoying this video, hit that subscribe button, like I said before, and become a part of the game, bro. If you want more videos like this, do me a favor and hit that like button. It shows me that you guys like these videos. To be real, I'm gonna make these top tens anyway, but like the video, it shows YouTube's algorithm that you are y'all fuck with me, right? Being that shows YouTube that it'll put my video under another person's video for that person's followers to follow me. You feel where I'm getting at? There you go. Now hit a like for your boy on this video. It's your boy Steph. As always, till next time, I love you guys, and I'm out. Peace.